Well, good morning. Isn't it fun driving uh, down 19 and seeing a roof? Isn't that kind of cool? That is uh, pretty neat. It's going to change the dynamics and look of the building. Hey, it's been an awesome day already. Today is Youth Sunday. Kind of the youth invasion takeover has happened. And uh, I, I can't thank our teenagers enough for just how they're being salt and light. Would you agree with me? Yeah, thank you. And uh, incredibly talented young people. And uh, let, me, let me just say this, not because I'm supposed to, but because I really want to. Um, at 6 o'clock every night from 6 to 8, um, there's a gathering of young men and women from 6 to the 8th grade on this end of the building. And I believe there are about 16 uh, volunteers, along with Pastor Jason and Alicia, who really do a knockout job. And I'll tell you what, they pour into our kids. And uh, I say that because my family personally has benefited with them. There is nothing more fulfilling than when your children come home from youth group and share what they have learned and say, you know what, man, you've been teaching us this and I, 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 I'm starting to get it. The light bulb has come on. And I, I would encourage you as parents, I know your schedules are phenomenally busy and I know you have a lot on your plate. But one of the best things we have found personally to do with our children is to entrust them to the care of uh, these folks that shepherd our kids. They, they, let's, if you work with youth, um, would you please stand up? We want to honor you, and we want to thank you. We can't thank you enough. Please stand up. Let's thank them. They, they rock it. They do an awesome, awesome job. So again, tonight at 6, they'll be... Uh, learning from the Bible and, and have a great time. Send your, your kids there. All right. I, I asked this for service and the answer so depressed me. I just wanted to walk off the stage. So how many of you remember what your homework assignment was last week? Raise your hand. Okay. You were to read how many verses? Come on. How many? How many of you did it? Oh, good. I won't walk off the stage. Good. That's awesome. I know last week we may have some guests here. I encourage our people in our church to invite someone. And if you are here this particular Sunday, thank you for um, the risk and the trust that you gave to be here today. What we want to do for the next 35 to hour and a half, no, I'm teasing. All right. Next 35 minutes is I want to teach you. It's really not preachy. It's more teachy. Uh, but I, I want to walk through just these two verses and, and really, I, I think, bring some things together. Now, I'm giving a lot of information in a brief period of time. And if there are any sheets left, if you want some kind of follow-up info, as you go out on the table in the back, there's a sheet you can pick up. If you go on our website at www.rockprairie.net under uh, Resources Family Faith Talk, you can get some information there. So, hey, if you got your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 1, right? And so help me out. What ver two verses are we looking at today? Come on. Romans what? Good. Romans 1, 16 and 17. So I'm going to read them. And then uh, just for the next few minutes, we're going to unpack them. Deal? Deal. Good. All right, here we go. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul is writing to a group of Christians in the uh, city of Rome. And he's giving them uh, insight as to how to take their new faith and live it out in a culture that is, is godless. That um, their God was themselves, their God was their money, their God was their sex. And so they're trying to figure out how do we, how do we maintain our allegiance to God and yet still be culturally relevant. Man, that's a struggle all of us have. So Paul's going to give us phenomenal insight today. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 16. Paul writes, for I am not, can you say the next word with me? Okay, I'm not ashamed of the, can you say the next word? Gospel. So Paul is writing as a bondservant. He wants these Roman Christians to know, first and foremost, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because, or here's why, it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of it because in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
So what, what I want to do, and again, this, this is just logic, we want to answer some questions today. So if we can go to the next slide. So if Paul isn't ashamed of the gospel, it would be good for all of us to know what the gospel is, right? So the gospel, uh, again, Paul's going to give us this answer. Real quick, take your Bibles, go this way in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. What is he not ashamed of? He's not ashamed of the gospel. What is the gospel? Here you go. 1 Corinthians 15 Look at uh, verse 3. Paul's writing, same guy that wrote to the Roman Christians, is writing and he says, For I deliver to you as of first importance. In other words, Paul would say, I'm a bondservant of Christ, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel because everything else that's going to happen, every other decision that I'm going to make, every challenge that I'm going to face in my life, the gospel and Jesus are first. So I write this to you of first importance that I received. Here's the gospel. Number one, Christ died for our sins. So can you say that underlined portion on there? Christ, say it with me, died for... Okay, look at your neighbor and get your finger up. Here we go. Uh, Ready? Say this with me. Christ died, point at your neighbor for... Okay, your sins, all right? I'm not going to do grammar school today, just preaching, all right? Christ died for our sins, everyone's sins. Secondly, second part of the gospel that he was buried. And the Bible will tell us he was put in a grave for three days. Then after those three days, we'll celebrate it uh, in uh, March, Easter, that he was raised from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures. So, what Paul was not ashamed of, what Paul wouldn't back down from, what Paul wouldn't back away from, was the, say it, Okay, teaching, you get to talk in this classroom. So the gospel has three parts. Let's make sure we all get it. Here we go. First of all, that Christ died for my... Okay, then when he died, he was... And after three days, he conquered death by... Paul said that truth, that truth, everything else is subservient to that. That truth shapes how I choose to live my life, and why this was so important, why Paul was not ashamed of it, is secondly, second slide, uh, let's go there, is what the gospel does, all right? So this is what the gospel is. Christ died for your sins. He was buried the third day. Say it with me. He did what? He rose again. Now, why he wasn't ashamed of it is not just what it is, but what it does. And he's going to flesh this out. Go back to Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God. Now look at me. The gospel does not give the power of God. The the gospel does not convey the power of God. Literally, this historical event is the power of God. Well, it, it, it does powerfully what? Here's what it does. For it is the power of God for, say the next word, salvation. Who needs to be saved? The people that God died for, which is who? Okay, so everyone, you, as good as you are, aside from Christ, need help. And lots of it, right? And you can't help yourself. So if I need saved, question, what do I need saved from? Well, my sin, but what happens, what does God do because I'm a sinner? Look at verse 18. For the, what's the next word? You, apart from Jesus, because you are a sinner, deserve the wrath of God. The ultimate wrath of God is given when you die and God allows you because of your sin and of your own free will to live in a very real place originally designed and created for the devil and his angels called hell. So, Paul would say this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, The gospel is Christ died for Kevin Dane's sin, 
Kevin's got a lot of it, right? Oh, no, all right, Kevin. He died for Kevin. Uh, his brother-in-law's nodding his head. But anyways, he died for Kevin's sin. And apart from Kevin putting his faith and trust in Jesus, he justly deserves the full fury of the wrath of God. Everyone following me. And so why Paul says, this is so magnificent that I'm not ashamed of it because it takes the human race that is separated from God, deserving the wrath of God, that can't help themselves get back together with God. God in His love sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for my sin so that the possibility of me not experiencing and absorbing and being a, a recipient of the wrath of God. It is the only hope of the world. It is the only remedy for my sin. And I can try to do everything right. And, and Isaiah would say, even in my attempt at incredible righteousness, I still fall profoundly flat on my face. And even the good that I do, I still deserve the wrath of God. And Paul would say, what, what happens though, there's a moment in time, just like the resurrection wasn't a fairy tale, it was an actual historic event where Jesus rose from the dead. And, and Paul would say the gospel, when it is shared, when it is proclaimed, when it is lived, offers to a sinner trying to figure out and fix their life hope and how a person receives this gift, which is the power of God, the Bible says is by believing or entrusting or putting your complete faith in. It's transferring ownership of a person who because of their sin was worthy of the wrath of God. Is everyone following me? Okay, then lie. Nod your head yet. No, okay. Everybody follow. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this because of not only what it is, but what it does. The Bible says when a person says yes to Jesus, I love this verse, if anyone is in Christ, they are a, some of you know it, finish it, a what? New creature. So in other words, when I say yes as a sinner worthy of the wrath of God, when I say yes to the gift of salvation, not only is my eternal damnation taken away, that's mercy, I get grace. And grace gives an unworthy person what they don't deserve. Not only am I not going to hell, but I get to go to heaven. It's mercy and grace. But the truth of the gospel is also that not only do I continue to live my life enslaved and ruled by the sin that deserves to be punished by God. But God literally says, look down at verse 17, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So in other words, I go from, and the Bible uses this terminology, that without Jesus, I am a son, you ready, of the devil. Because the devil is the author of sin. But when I say yes to Jesus... The wrath of God is taken away. The righteousness of God is put on me. And now I go from son of the devil to son and daughters of... And my whole nature changes. So it's more, hear me, than coming down an aisle and praying a prayer and saying yes to Jesus. And I've kind of secured and made the reservation in heaven. The gospel also includes a change in my life, right? Right? Because before I operated under the control of uh, my sin, uh, the control of my wants, the impulses of my flesh. But now that I'm in Christ, my wanter has changed. Okay? Anybody here ever try to do a diet? Anybody ever try to do a diet? Okay, my wife and I decided, more me, that I need to lose weight. And so I got this thing called Weight Watchers. Anybody ever heard of Weight Watchers? Don't judge, okay? Don't judge, all right? And so on this thing on my phone, I record my points. Anybody ever done that? And I'm telling you, the sucker works, all right? And so I mean, everything you eat and everything you put down there. And so now that I am motivated to lose weight, I examine every food I eat. Did you know one Reese's cup 
one. And I'm not going to tell you how many points I got, all right? So then you'll figure out my weight and I'll feel shame. But anyways, I'm fat. I don't worry about it. But I, I want to be healthier, okay? One Reese's cup is 10 points. See, wrath of God right there. <laughs> wrath of God. Okay, we'll get to you in a second, all right? I got that. Well, you don't need a mic, but anyways, all right? <laughs> now the computer has to reboot. Thank you very much, all right? So anyways, so before when I didn't care, I would, I, I would eat eight or nine of them suckers in a minute and a half. It is worth it, all right? Confession time. And, and it's, but now that I, I know I need to change, I look at that Reese's cup not as my friend, but as my enemy. Because it's not helping me. Wink, wink, back in the back row. And so, because, hear me, because I, my wanter has changed, but I still struggle and attempted, I wrestle with this decision and I choose painfully not to eat. And so as I'm changing and living according to truth, I, I do this in a culture that doesn't necessarily believe what I believe. For instance, there would be some wicked souls that believe eating Reese's cup is worth it. <laughs> and there would be a person who knows it has its profound effects. All right. And so how then do I take living out truth in a culture that God has called me to reach and yet not compromise that truth? So can we go to the next slide? So when Paul says, I'm not ashamed, here is what he's talking about. Because I live in a culture, by the way, I want you to see this. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Here is why it is so hard. If you, if, you, if you become a new Christian and you try to live out your faith and you feel this pressure, you know what I'm talking about? You, you, you feel like, hey, I want to I do right. And, and sometimes I feel this pressure that doing right isn't welcomed around me. Where does that come from? Why does that happen? I love Paul because he gives us an answer. <laughs> Look at Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. Here's why it is so difficult. Who by their unrighteousness, what do they attempt to do with the truth? You know what? They, they, they don't want to hear it. Now, our culture is there and they've moved beyond that. Not only do they not want to hear truth, not do they only want to see you live truth, here is what the culture, they've taken it to another level. Skip down, go to Romans chapter 1, and uh, go to verse 20, uh, 24. God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. Not only do they suppress the truth, but do you see what they do in the next verse, verse 25? Because they do what? They exchange the truth. You see it? They try to redefine the truth. But then our culture has taken it to even another level that makes it harder for you to live out the truth. Skip all the way down and go down to verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, here's what, they not only do them, but give, do you see it? Approve. So here is what the culture that God has put you in. And you are trying to live out the gospel. Listen to me. The gospel is the love of God and the truth of God put together. You live in a culture that doesn't want to hear the truth. They don't want to see the truth. They don't even want you to not agree with them because you are loyal to truth. And they celebrate wrong and mock truth. They want to shut you up. Not only is it you can believe what you believe and I'll believe what I believe, they attack you to quiet, sorry, the truth. 
But So when Paul says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel that Christ died, he was buried, and he resurrected. What the gospel does is it takes a person worthy of the wrath of God. It, it not only changes their eternal de destination, it gives them a new way of living according to the truth of God. And so as I live out the truth of God, inevitably there is going to be this huge collision in a culture that suppresses the truth, tries to change the truth, and, and, and punishes truth. You are eventually going to have to make a choice. Am I going to live according to truth? Or am I going to, hear me, edit truth to live in a culture that suppresses, rejects, and tries to redefine truth. Now, this, this is the whole linchpin of this sermon. If you find yourself editing truth to share the love of God to a culture that you live in, you are ashamed of the gospel. Let me repeat that. If you ever find yourself in a place where in an attempt to make the love of God more appealing more um, appetizing, more accommodating to a culture that suppresses, rejects, and tries to alter and redefine truth. If you ever find yourself in an attempt to be a messenger of God, you find yourself editing, dumbing down, minimizing, denying the truth. Paul would say this, you are ashamed of the gospel. On top of that, everyone good, to share the love of God, separate from the complete revealed truth of God, you are sharing anything but the gospel. You take the truth of God and you separate that from the love of God. The gospel then isn't the gospel of Jesus. You have made God impotent and powerless. And that's what we face. See, Jesus doesn't just give truth. Jesus doesn't just give moral suggestions. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 6. Everybody following me. I am the way. Say the next phrase. The what? And the? No one, no one comes to the Father but through. You cannot separate the truth of what Jesus did on the cross from the truth of the revealed scriptures of God. And what has happened, because we live in a culture that suppresses, rejects, and exchanges the truth of God. We want to reach people, but we, we feel the shame of the truth, so we try to edit the truth of God to reach people. Next slide. So, next slide. We already answered that. I love Dr. S Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Think about this. Are everybody thinking? The gospel has a restraining influence on culture. Like a dam holding back the flood of secularism when worldliness and accommodation have infiltrated the church, a culture has go gone as low as it can go more late. Look at me. God called you to be a messenger of truth, not adjust the truth so a godless culture believes in him. And when we start moving the lines of truth to accommodate a godless culture, society as a whole begins to go backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards. We are the last bastion of light Jesus said this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How did it get so dark? Because men who are unrighteous and don't care about God suppress, reject, and attempt to redefine truth. And the light that shines feels the pressure and the shame of a dark culture. And the question that you have to answer personally is, are you going to be unashamed of the gospel? And here is what the Apostle Paul is writing to these Roman Christians. 
that I have chosen, predecided, predetermined, that no matter what shame I experience because of my loyalty to the truth, it's worth it, and I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you? Next slide. That's pretty weak, but anyway, thank you, Kareen. Yeah, Kareen's not ashamed, but all of you got to work on it, all right? Especially the Reese's lady, but we'll talk about that, all right? So, here is what you and I feel every day. Here is what you and I, I mean, it's hard. I'm, listen, this isn't like us against them. We're there to reach them. But the problem is, when you edit the truth of God to reach them, you're not helping them. And so living out the gospel, love and truth brings us into direct conflict with the culture around us. But at the same time, and stop doing this us versus them. We are here in this community not to talk about them, but to love them. We, we are in this community. Hey, if someone didn't love me, a sinner worthy of the wrath of God, and come after me, I wouldn't be in God's family. Anybody else? And so it's not about, hey, us in here got it together and them out there, woo, they're jacked up, right? Hey, we're jacked up in here, aren't we? And the only dividing line of humanity isn't how much money you have, what race you are, what nationality you are. The dividing line as God sees humanity is those who are under the wrath of God and those who have believed and accepted and live according to the grace of God. That is it. And we're here as heralds, as messengers of the cure for the human race of sin. We are to love our community. We are to love sinners. We are to go to them. We are to be with them. We are to serve them. But we are not, hear me, to condone their sin. We, we are not to say, okay, hey, in this friendship... This is what I believe, and I know what you believe, and you got to pick. And for and, and this very dangerous thinking that, well, if, if, if I pick truth, and the condition of our relationship is they want me to choose, you know what Paul would say? I love you very much. I don't want us to be in this position, but if you're asking me to decide truth or you, I choose truth. I'm not putting us in this position. You are. And you're demanding me to endorse a lifestyle and a way of life that God says is not true. I love you. I want to be with you. I want to serve you. But I cannot say it's okay. Why? Because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not because I'm better than you. Not because I judge you. But I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What's happened Hear me. As Christians feel God needs their help to edit, to soften, to take the edge off, to customize the truth of God, to make it more palatable to a world that suppresses, rejects, and redefines the truth. You are not helping build God's kingdom. You are internally destroying God's kingdom. And man, I feel the pressure, don't you? Paul would say this, if in living out your faith, you have never experienced shame, you've never experienced any pushback, you've, it, it, it's never cost you a relationship. You, hey, in your faith, you've never been misquoted, misrepresented, misevaluated, unjustly accused. If that has never been your experience in your Christian faith, here's what Paul would say, you're living your gospel out ashamed. Stings, doesn't it? So, go to the next slide, please. Go to the next slide, please. Let me give you a current... I mean, you're like, well, wow, you're talking about current events. You're making this a political issue. It's not a political issue. It's a truth issue. Over in Wheaton College is an evangelical school. How many of you have heard of Wheaton? Wheaton is fundamentally sound. They have a political science professor there named Larisha Hawkins. Larisha Hawkins, who signed a doctrinal statement at Wheaton, um, and, and Wheaton is very fundamentally sound. They believe in God, as the Bible would say, Jesus. 
A professor who signed that doctrinal statement in agreement said this, that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. Let me ask you a question. Is that a true or false statement? Let me ask you again, is that a true or is it a false statement? Okay. So this school whose foundation is biblical truth is attempting to fire her because of this statement. Again, is this statement true or false? False. A professor in the school made this statement who teaches at Wheaton. Here we go. Again, angered that they would fire this individual that would make such a statement. And Wheaton's point is, it's not that she's a bad teacher. It's fundamentally, she does not agree with the foundation of truth that our college is founded on. A professor frustrated that the school is taking this action, made this statement. We have been entrenched in a white male evangelical group think for so long. We need to get out of that. It has to come by bringing fresh voices and new perspectives. But when you have those fresh voices, you can't say you don't sound enough like a white male evangelical. She was not sounding enough like the, white, the old school way of doing things. Here you go. Look at that last statement. It's time for a new what? You know what theology is? It's what you believe about God. What do you do when you're a president of that college, knowing that firing this person who will not retract that statement, you'll be sued? The school will probably be sued so much so that it potentially could be closed. Why would, why, hey, why don't you just say, hey, she didn't mean it and just let her go back in the classroom? What would you do? It's no big deal. She's just expressing her opinion. What do you do as a church when as we're trying to reach people and there is this pressure to officiate weddings that we believe are not biblical and are chastising the community as being viewed judgmental? What do you do? What are you going to do when your daughter comes home and has a discussion at their lunch table and they begin to talk about different choices of other children, how are you going to instruct them? And knowing that how your child responds may cost them a circle of friends, may cost them a spot on some club because of all the politics behind it. Oh, this is tipped and politics don't happen here, but let's talk about another place, right? They happen everywhere. You are in a position as a bondservant of Jesus Christ, whether you like it or not, that eventually you have to decide between truth or trying. You have to decide between I'm going to obey truth and I will suffer the shame because of it, or I'm going to edit the truth to keep my Christian life comfortable. Now, let me say this. We have complicated the problems. Real quick, we're almost done. First Peter, go to First Peter 3. You're like, you said that five minutes ago. All right, First Peter chapter 3. <sighs> Unfortunately, I think we get it a little backwards because sometimes we are so obnoxious and un- unloving about truth that it's tainted people's view of God. Would you agree? That, that sometimes Christians, I mean, protesting um, soldiers' funerals because God is judging them, that's ridiculous. And so Peter gives us this incredible balance that you and I wrestle with how to navigate these, these challenging, and by the way, they are incredibly challenging times. First Peter chapter 3, look at verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. And I love what, I love what Peter says to us, saying it to you. Hey, don't be afraid. But, but God, if, if, I, if I'm in this circle of friends and they ask me and I have to share your truth and I want to do it gently and respectfully, that my reputation could take a hit. And here's what he says, don't be afraid of that. He says, here's what, in, in, <laughs> he says, hey, don't be afraid and don't worry about it. Well, he says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. In other words, listen, just decide ahead of time that I'm, if, if I have to decide between truth 
and in compromising and editing the truth of God. I'm going to choose truth. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you of the reason of the hope that lies within you. And I love this. Do it gently and what? Hey, I am no better than you. But you know what? Here's the truth of God that I believe with all my heart so much so that I have taken my entire life and I've committed it to God. And man, I love you. and I think you're a great guy. And if you're asking me what I think, I love you, but I I just don't agree with the decision you're making. And I want to help you. I want to encourage you. And I've struggled too. And I'm thankful I have people around me. But if you're asking me, oh, so now you're judging me. Now you don't love me. No, that's not the case. And they may push in on you where honestly you're backed into a corner where you have to choose. Guess what? Paul would say when I'm backed into a corner, I choose Jesus. And those days are here. And so here's what he said. I love this. Having a good conscience so that, not if that, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Here's what he says. It's better to suffer for doing good that it should be God's will than for doing evil. If we can go to our last slide. Let me ask you a very simple question. And it's one that I, I want to guide your thinking and, and you evaluate and you come to the conclusion. Here's the deal. We think gospel is I, I come to a point in time where I pray and I receive Jesus. Absolutely. But part of the gospel then is not only receiving the gift of salvation for my eternal life, it is receiving the truth of God, how I live life. And hear me, the gospel, the two cannot be separated. They go together. And so many of you have prayed this prayer. You have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And in doing so, in giving your life to the person of Christ, you also, whether you knew it or not, committed to obeying the truth of Christ. And and God gives a warning shot across the bow for us, church people. And I want you to see the second verse. So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever, say the next word. Okay, think with me. If the gospel is what Jesus did in truth, if I claim faith in Jesus and deny or edit or compromise the truth of Jesus... Do you see the connection? I claim faith. I prayed the prayer. I got baptized. I publicly declared him. But in living my life, I edit the truth. I deny the truth. I compromise the truth. Look at me. You are denying Jesus. Do you understand that Paul was writing to a group of Roman Christians that about 35 years from the time they got this letter, literally they would stand before Roman authorities and they would say this, you deny Christ or you and your family will die. History records that Christian families, entire families, husbands, fathers, and children were uh, dragged into an arena with lions who were starved for three days Why Roman citizens, those who suppressed, exchanged, and tried to redefine the truth for entertainment, watched uh, starved beasts maul and devour men, women, and children. And what, could it, what they could have done to escape that was simply to deny Christ. And they chose not to be ashamed. You know, I, I'm a type of guy that all of this talking is, it's kind of, I, I want to leave you with an illustration, all right? Uh, many years ago, there was a team in the professional uh, National Football League called the Saints. Anybody remember the Saints? Okay. In 1980, the Saints began their NFL season 0-14. Okay, it wasn't fun. And the saints um, were, were not very happy about that. And there was a particular guy that was a huge fan of the saints. And so after an 0-14 start, he then told all the fans of the saints, 
hey, we don't want you to stop coming to the game, but when you come to the game, I want you to wear, remember? I want you to wear a paper bag over your head when you come to the football game. How many of you remember this? Okay, some of you my age, when you see this, think of the unknown comic on the gong show, don't you? All right, anybody else think about that, right? And so this is what is happening. That they went and had a Saints jersey on, and they were a fan of the team. But because they didn't like what the team stood for, they did not want to be publicly identified with the team. And God says, you cannot... You cannot live faith that way. You either have to choose to be identified openly with the person of God and the truth of God. You cannot be a fan of God. And because you know what? The truth is so hard and I'm going to absorb shame in being loyal to the truth that, that I anonymously try to live out my faith by editing the truth of God, by dumbing it down, by customizing let me give you just an insight to actually how God feels about that, that vein of Christianity. And we're done. Revelation chapter 3 says this to the church of Laodicea. Because, because, because. Not because you don't have church. Not because you don't have a wana, Not because you don't have student ministry. Not because you're doing good things. Because you are neither cold or Makes me nauseated. So my question to you is, you have to decide. As David plays, the the gospel is the entirety of God's love and the entirety of God's truth brought together. And we live in a culture that wants to pit the love of God against the truth of God. And we feel that pressure. And in an effort, maybe good intention, but incredibly damning decision, in an effort to try to accommodate and reach a culture that suppresses and tries to redefine the truth of God, we feel that we have the right to edit the truth of God, to explain the truth of God. God would say, when you do that, You are ashamed of the gospel. It is one thing as a teenager to come to Rock Prairie Baptist Church and sit here. It's great. Glad to do it. Not many kids do. I I wonder when you walk into the school, if in your backpack you have one of these and you try to live out your faith anonymously. Whoever denies me before men I'll deny before my father. It's one thing to bring your family here, dad, and then when when you walk into Chrysler and you go on that business trip, what happens there, right? I wonder if in that overnight bag you've got packed one of these. It's one thing, mom and dad, to bring your kids here, and, and you know what? You're above the curve. But in your home, if your faith is lived like this, when you start feeling the shame of your faith, let, let me just tell you, you you're going to produce little ones who will follow in your footsteps. So, Jesus put it this way. Whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Remember what he said? Take up your what? Let's go. For for some today, and you know it, and I love the the Bible when you preach it, man, it it hits you. For some of you today, it, it is time in your job and in your school to just rip the bag up. And I'm, I'm going to stop trying to edit and soften and compromise and, and, and try to avoid the tough conversations because I'm going to experience some shame. Because you know what? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And it's not that I'm any better than anyone. I'm not judging anyone. But listen, what the gospel is and what the gospel does, it is the only hope. See, the problem with the church is, here, here's, here's the problem, why the power is missing. After a while, sin gets old. After a while, sin loses its excitement. 
After a while, sin leaves open wounds. Anybody here know that? And so, hey, if, if I am, am in this sin, why would I want to go to a church that says that sin is okay? They're not going to help me. Why would I want to be around a Christian that thinks, you know what, hey, just live any way you want. As long as you pray the magic prayer, God loves you and God's cool with you. Why would I talk to you when I'm trying to get out of this? I don't need rationalization to continue to keep doing it. And so this brings all of us to a point where we have to, to decide. Not only am I going to pray the prayer and be freed from the wrath of God, I am going to live out the truth of God even if it costs me my reputation in this community even if we are publicly dragged through the mud because they don't agree with our position on truth. Hear me, even if I'm misrepresented, even if I'm misquoted, even if my reputation is just thrashed. Remember what Peter said? Do not fear. Do not worry. You'll be blessed. So the invitation today is really in your seat. And it's a decision for you to decide, to live, to choose. I am unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because without it, there is no hope. And I'm not going to rob the gospel of the power. And with that love comes every bit of ounce of God's complete revealed truth. Who's with me? Going to do it? Hey, do you know there's coming a day when because the church will not honor certain lifestyles, the church will lose its tax exemption. You know that's coming, right? You know, there will be a day because your ministers on staff will not officiate certain weddings and due to discriminatory laws that eventually will come, will be arrested. Legislation's already in the works for that. There'll come a day when your association with what is going on around here and what we believe and do, people will question you and judge you. Do you know that? So what are you going to do? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And in the backdrop of this threat, God wants us to shine his lights and reach our community and love our community and in love and, and just let sinners know how loved they are. And so we're not going to stop that. We're going to do it even more. We're going to be more intentional about that. Y you know what? Here's what I, I don't agree with them, but I can't deny that they really do love me, that they really do care about this community. I, I, I don't get why they believe. I think they're, they're, they're out in some space world and all of that. But you know what? One thing is undeniable is this church, as weird as they are, love us, and they prove it, and they demonstrate it, right? So, the, the temptation is to just shore up and kind of play the victim. We're not going to play the victim. We're going to go reach them with the gospel and the truth, but we're not going to compromise the truth. And that gets a little challenging, all right? I've said enough, let's pray. Father, you're good. Man, you've given us a lot to think about today. So, Father, today I pray that you would raise up generations that will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That we would have D6 parents that, Father, as they sit around the family table and discuss these challenging issues, that, Father, kids would have opportunity to see their parents um, experience a little shame because of their commitment to the gospel. Father, some people will not get jobs because of their allegiance to truth. Help them to continue to trust you in that moment. Some kids will be left out and uninvited, Father, because of their, their love for Jesus. And Father, um, help them not to worry about it. But Father, be blessed in it. God, this is so hard to do. And so, Father, that's why we need one another. Help us this week as we come to those, those clashes of truth, Father, in, in untruth lies that help us to choose truth. And Father, the reason we do that is we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Father, be with us. Give us wisdom in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, hey, it is so good to see you here. Hey, today our youth has blessed us with extraordinary service.
So before you bebop on out of here, find one of them use and say thank you very much. Give them a hug and a $10 bill. All right, God bless you. Have a good day.